Thanks for coming on the show, Leighton. How you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Um, no problem. No problem at all. Yeah, I'm excited to, to, to chat. Um, so if you don't mind, just start by saying what's up to the audience um, and then share something that you believe to be the biggest myth when it comes to growing a business. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, biggest myth when it comes to growing a business. Um, I think people believe that the hardest part is coming up with a concept, having an idea, a good business idea. Of course, that's super critical. But, you know, 90% of the work is execution. So I think um, the, the real hard work concept, and I think that's sometimes, sometimes missed, lost on people, in, unless they're serial entrepreneurs and then they know it very well. It's kind of like, yeah, you, you need to just just start, just start doing something because to your point, like 90% of it is execution based. Um, mm -hmm. But that's not to say that it should be thoughtless execution, right? Um, mm -hmm. You should have a plan and, and strategy in place, but yeah, the 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 real real growth or or anything that actually happens is 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 because of the actual things that you do. So just start doing them. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So can you? And I know you're uh, you're like you're a fractional CFO, and you sort of uh, give those services to to some of your clients. But can you walk us through your journey to becoming? Uh, sort of CFO focused and and also like an entrepreneur. Yeah, sure. So I mean, I started out in in large organizations in Germany, like like Mercedes Benz and Deutsche Telekom. Then I moved into the software industry, but also large software companies such as Oracle, NetSuite. Um, and I guess you know, as as much as I would like to think I was successful and managed to make my way into sort of middle management, um, maybe even senior management, I was still a fairly small cog in a very large organization. Uh, even even with some level of success, you still generally end up feeling like a fairly small cog in a very large machine. Um, and so as I became more and more exposed to smaller companies by working on M&A um, transactions, you know, through these large organizations, buying these small companies, meeting the founders and management of these small organizations, and then becoming a mentor at the Alchemist Accelerator Program in San Francisco, I was exposed to a number of entrepreneurs and I found it quite uh, compelling you know, their tenacity, their entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and basically, I decided, well, I realized that many of these startups needed financial guidance, financial advisory, help figuring out things like, you know, how much how much money to raise, how to raise it, on, under which terms, which securities, you know, how, how long would that money last them? Um, what would the dilution effect be? When would they need to raise again? How to explain to investors what the ROI might look like? Um, I realized that they need that and they many companies have to begin with some kind of book, bookkeeping services, let's say, or maybe a CPA that does their taxes for them. They don't have, they don't have a CFO. And the, and the reason is quite simple. They typically can't afford a CFO. And honestly, they don't need a full-time CFO, but they do need some help. And I was able to give them some guidance on a fractional basis, meaning basically part-time could be anything between an hour and 10 hours a week for each client in the phase that they're in. And so by doing that, you know, I found myself somewhat of a larger cog in a much smaller machine, <laughs> um, yeah. meaning you could actually make a difference and influence things and, and add value that I could, that was noticed. Um, and that, that was obviously, it gave me a lot of job satisfaction. And um, that was uh, one of the reasons why I've enjoyed it so much. I've been doing it now for about four years, four or five years. And um, I feel like I learn, I've learned in those four or five years as much as I did in the prior 10 years, hands down. Um, yeah. Every day is different, every day is a challenge. Um, so it's fun. Yeah, that's amazing. How did you how did you get started? Like, like I I know you you wanted to step away from the sort of um, typical corporate environment. Mm -hmm. um, did you just leverage all of your sort of connections that you had, or like what was what was that process like? Yeah, so I met people um, just through you know general networking, friends of friends who said, "Well, we could do we could use some help. Can you help us?" And so to begin with, I would just pr provide some kind of advisory guidance basically kind of pro bono just because they were friends of friends. And I just realized that the demand is there. And I, I just kind of stayed working with various future clients. I guess. And I just thought to myself, well, if I can go out there and find, you know, a few more people like this, I can make a business out of this and I can go solo and, and, and leave the large corporate world um, and just my own, my own boss and create my own little company, kind of a, a niche boutique uh, financial services or not, not so much financial services. C I call it CFO services. 
company. Um, you know, and meanwhile, uh, over the years, I've found myself helping with more COO type of work because a lot of these founders are either very good at sales or maybe they're very good at tech technology. They might be computer scientists, let's say. They're not necessarily um, fans of, nor do they have the time to figure out kind of running back office, running operation, running the team. So um, I find myself self kind of in a CFO stroke COO role. Um, and, uh, you know, I really enjoy that because it gets me involved with helping a startup on their journey. Um, you know, it's, it's quite the adventure. It can be a bumpy ride, of course, um, very bumpy. Um, you know, you never quite know how you're going to make the next payroll. Um, some, not always, but you know, if, if, if you're fundraising, fundraising always takes longer than you think, you know, and um, especially in the recent environment where interest rates are, have gone somewhat crazy. Um, they're very cautious with their cash, especially angel investors who are sitting on their checkbooks and waiting for something to happen that makes them feel confident that the, the, the you know geopolitical situation is going to be stabilized and perhaps interest rates will stop going up and uh, maybe we'll have a soft landing or not, right? It's, it's really, if you read three articles, you probably get three different opinions on whether we're going to have a, a recession or how severe the recession might be and what's happening with interest rates. Um, so as, as folks are navigating this uncertainty, they tend to hold back on investing in riskier type of um, investments like startups. Uh, so that being said, we, we are reading a lot about um, copious amounts of funds being ready to be, you know, that are p- currently parked and ready to be invested. So I'm hoping to be able to join my startup clients um, with some, you know, uh, some successful fundraising in the next few quarters. Yeah, that's amazing. And sort of to that point of like, basically this, the, the VC slash investment market, if you can call it that, just being tightened um, in terms of what, what they choose to actually invest in. How important is it for a startup to have a strong financial model? Um, and then the part two of that is like, uh, what are the key components founders should focus on when preparing their financial projections for investors? Hmm. Well, I think it's critical and, and not just for the investor looking in. I mean, an investor will have, especially an institutional investor like a VC, they'll have their own opinion on what a company might be worth and what they might need to spend to, to be able to ramp up and so on. But I think what they want to see is they, they want to see that a founder has gone through the process of sitting down and really mapping out how they want to um, execute their business, what the costs of that um, will be in terms of you know headcount and other resources, and also what the pipeline to um, sales conversion pathway could look like and how long that will take. I think that's really critical, but not only for the investor to see that the founder has gone through that process, but also for the founder themselves to understand Oh, hold on a second. If I think about it, maybe it does take me three years to get where I want to. When I thought where I thought I could get in a year, I think it's an aha effect for them themselves. Um, you know, I often find myself when I'm sitting together with a founder, saying, "Okay, well, you know, you, the, here's here's what you want to get done this year. Now let's start, let's sit down and map that out. And when you do that, you realize, oh yeah, we probably have three years work ahead of us. Of course, the founder. It's like you know, when you tell a founder that their business plan is going to take them longer to execute, it's like telling them that their baby's ugly, right? You, you don't. Yeah, you have to be diplomatic, um, but most of the time, if you're able to kind of share some experience that you've made, um, they'll be, you know, fine to understand and appreciate that they might not be able to get to 100 million revenue, you know, three years from now. It might take five or seven or 10 years, and they may never get there. And that's okay to 50 million revenue or even 20 million in revenue, and you can be profitable and you can have a, you could even have a comfortable life. Is that what that's what you're looking for? I'm not sure that's. The goal of these folks, maybe later on in, in, in life, they want to be comfortable for now. Of course, they they want to create the next unicorn. Um, but uh, I mean, last night, for example, I worked through, I say last night because the, the client's down in Singapore. And so it was daytime for him. Um, but we worked through his model. And I basically um, rationalized and sort of reduced the top line while keeping or even adding to the cost. Um, but the good news is I was able to encourage him that, it's it's achievable and that if he's able to achieve the numbers that the, even these revised numbers, you know, he'd still be in a great spot. You know, his NPV calculation came out at, you know, over 30 million. If we use comps, multiples, you know, by year two, he, he'd have the valuation more than what he was looking for. So he was quite comfortable. And so for him, it was an eye-opening effect that he could have a financial model that wasn't quite as hugely ambitious, but 
still was would be considered very successful. And I told him, I said, to, I asked because the VC was on the call as well. And I said to the VC, how many how many companies do you know that make it to 100 million revenue in five years? Very few, very few. Um, and this guy was mapping out a lot more than that, but now it's around 100, which is still very ambitious, but um, we think it's achievable. So um, that was the answer to the first question and trying to trying trying to answer the question about um, uh, you know the, the the importance of the financial model. What was the second question, sorry? The key components that founders should focus on when preparing their financial projections. Right. Well, um, I think I touched upon it. It's it's being realistic, um, but also. Typically, you know, product market fit, depending on what stage you're at, um, they may already have that. They may have already, you know, done some pilots. They may have some clients on board already. At that point, it becomes scalability and repeatability, right? Because one of the key problems that most companies have once they've gotten through, let's say, the first two, three years, maybe they're, they're a round stage, um, you go beyond uh, selling to the people that the CEO knows and you go to a point where you now need to be able to repeat sales to people that are not in your network just because you have a good product and because you have a good sales reach or outreach process. And that's something that's kind of a, a big milestone, I think, for many of my clients who, you know, I, I often get involved with clients who are literally at the seed stage pre-revenue. Um, they've kind of figured, they've got an idea, they're figuring out, you know, whether the idea can work. They pivot a few times. You know, we talked about this at the outset. Execution in many cases means pivoting, right? Um, changing the way your idea works. I just I have a client, for example, who was all about dashboards competing with large other software companies and realized that actually they're not really doing dashboards. They're doing they're kind of outsourcing the IT function for some of their clients. And so they're pivoting that way. Um, but I think, you know, the, the key points in the in the um, financial model are how to make the sales, how to make sales happen. Because the rest follows. Right. You can even in this current market where it's really difficult to find t- talent because everyone seems to have a role, right? There, there are very few people, especially in the Bay Area, who are unemployed per se. So if you're a, you know, if you're a strong R&D programmer that went to Stanford or, you know, somewhere similar, or you've just been working at a large company like LinkedIn or Microsoft or Google, who knows, that person's employed, right? Those people are not on the bench, right? So to be able to hire them and be able to afford to pay them, um, it's it's tough. And that's, that's the same in finance. Um, you know, I was, a few months back, I was looking to try and do an audit um, for one of my clients and speak, spoken to some of the large audit, audit companies. And they said, yeah, we can do it in June. And this was, you know, this was February. They're booked up. They don't have the resources. Others will say, we don't have, we can't do it. Um, so resourcing, finding resources is tough, but from a financial model perspective, guesstimating what those salaries would look like is not hard. Um, figuring out what it's going to cost you to fix, you know, put your back office in place, maybe even have office space, or not, because you know, currently in the last few years, most people are focusing on working remote. But the cost piece is, is very straightforward. Not it's not not really rocket science. Um, product piece, you, a lot of these founders are product people, so they've got that down. Um, it's really just making the sales uh, sales process work and getting that right in the financials. Yeah, and speaking of that. Um getting the sales right like i'm assuming a large portion of the financial projection is based around what what we refer to as tam like total addressable market is there ever from your perspective have you ever seen your clients go one step further into tam because from a, from a marketing perspective so i'm a marketer uh, that's what i do but um, we like to, uh, and there are different sort of breakdowns or divisions of this number, but typically if you break up your TAM, um, your total addressable market into two segments, one is the in market segment and then the other one is out of market. So basically in market is they're ready to buy right now. Out of market is they have to be moved or nudged to, to become in market or whatever, whatever the reason is. Right. And that mm-hmm. typically the, I've heard there's, like I said, a bunch of different breakdowns of that, but 90% out of market is typically the case. And then 10% at a given time for in market. Is is that something that you've seen any of your clients sort of bake into the TAM? And if not, do you think that would be like valuable to someone that is potentially investing? Yeah, no, I think it, it is valuable. I mean, we often spend, my team and I, we spend some time helping clients kind of create their time, you know, figure out their time, do the research, find out what the time is. But 
you know, for me, much more critical than because at the end of the day, what you end up doing is saying, well, you know, the TAM um, for me is, you know, you, you do your SAM SAM. Samsung time analysis, you basically, or Tam Samsung, I guess it is, where you where you whittle down the market is, you know, multiple billions, right? Where we are, where we are sort of active is, let's say, many hundreds of millions or could still be billions. And the piece that we want to focus on is, you know, still many hundreds of millions. In other words, we need to get 0.1% of the of the of the TAM um, or the SOM to, to, to be able to be successful. And so because that's such a minute piece of the, and it, of course, it depends on what the clients are, but my clients are in, you know, the SaaS, data analytics, AI, um, and, and those fintech, health tech, insure tech. And those, of course, are huge, huge markets. Um, so but what usually ends up happening is they they create the TAM SAMSOM analysis. Um, in doing so, they're able to tell investors, hey, this is a huge opportunity, and we don't need to actually, you know, own much of the market. Our, our, our market share can be 0.1% and we're still going to get to you know 100 million or something crazy like that. Um, and so what really what really matters is again, go back to the point of execution. How do you go out there and actually find someone who's in who fits? Maybe it's the 10% that you mentioned, but it's all very well just to identify them. You still got to bring them on board. And onboarding, you know, getting a client to agree to either stop using what they're currently using or to make a change and do something different, both are difficult. Right, um, and to maybe allocate some budget that they didn't have, right? Um, these are all steps that are, are are really difficult, and that for me is the absolute quintessential kind of key to being successful as a startup. And it's less about you know the analysis itself, not to downplay that. That's important as a starting point, but the really important part for me, at least, is you know when you, I guess, bant the bant analysis is good, right? Do, do they have the budget? Um, you know, do they need, do they actually need this, right? And are you talking to the person who can make the decision, right? And what about timing? Can they, can they buy this from you in a year and it's fine or six months because that doesn't, that doesn't work, right? We don't have six months, you know? So, uh, so those are that, that whole, you know, the funnel approach, getting, getting from a Tam Sam Som analysis, or even, you know, like you said, drilling down further, still getting from that theory to an actual sale for me is by far the most critical element. How how can founders effectively demonstrate their startup's growth potential and progress towards key milestones to, to secure that higher valuation in their next funding round? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tough one. I mean, at the end of the day, you, you I feel I feel I feel for the founders when they're fundraising because um, you, know, you speak to you speak to a VC who shows some interest, wants to meet you. You know, maybe they they feel like you've got good credentials, good background, good team, or whatever it is that they're attracted to. But then, you know, towards the end of the conversation, it comes out, um, no surprise, they're looking for a company that has something like a million in ARR, right? Um, and that's when they get interested or begin to become interested. Um, or if you're on the track to making it to a million, so, you know, you've got some growth, you've rapidly gotten to, let's say, 800K. And so it's just a couple more clients until you get to a million. And then they want, then they're ready to invest. And then, of course, the clients are thinking, yeah, but at that point, I don't need you because, you know, here I am with, you know, 12K MRR or something small like that. And, you know, I need about 20 just to cover my costs. Um, but to get I need to be able to hire salespeople, which I can't afford to hire and so on. Um, so, in other words, it's kind of a chicken and egg situation um, where a founder will be frustrated because the institutional investors are not ready to invest until they've already gotten a level of traction that the founder might think would be sufficient for them to be done with fundraising. Now you always need more money. And so the, the VCs, of course, they have their role and they, they're able to help of course. Um, but as a founder, that's frustrating. So the, the alternative is, you know, you go to friends and family or to angels and to convince them when it comes to angels, and certainly friends and family, it's more about, you know, who are they investing? Uh, what's the concept? What's the market they're in? And less about, can this person, make the sales happen because when you're at the point where you're either pre-revenue or you just have some very early initial revenue, it's not repeatable. Um, and so it's highly speculative for what, for which reason, obviously angels, if they come in, they're expecting the highest returns. Um, nine times out of 10, they don't get them. Um, so it's a, it's quite a, it's quite a sort of a, um, a gauntlet that they have to run these startups I, and I, I help them with their fundraising as far as I can you know, obviously I put together with them their financial model I, I can connect them with investors um, you know I can give them some tips on 
you know, some of the do's and don'ts in the fundraising process. And I have folks that I work with on my team or, um, you know, uh, other, other consultants who help with pitching and putting together the deck and all this. But um, at the end of the day, an investor will invest because they believe that the CEO and the CEO's team can, keyword, execute. And of course, before you know, before they even get that far, they're gonna they're gonna want to check the boxes. Do I like this space? You know, is this AI or is it alternative energy? You know, a cool space um, to be in. Um, and do they have a concept which sounds also cool, right? But yet not yet proven. So um, it's a little bit of a shotgun approach. I think most most angels tend to invest in a number of different startups for this for the very reason that it's so speculative, and they hope it's going to make it. Um, so. And you know, they also they also hope that they'll make it in three to five years, and it can be ten years, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's yeah, I, that's three to five year timeline. That's pretty pretty ambitious and aggressive, but I mean, not not undoable. It's just you know, it's tough. Very unusual. It's very unusual. I, I have one. I have some good examples in, in, in my if you call it client portfolio. Uh, one group had had come up with a very good. Um, contract analytics software. They were in. They were coming towards the end of year two. They were looking for investment, and I, I got involved with them because I'd worked at a contract analytics company prior called Seal Software, where I was the uh, corporate CFO for a very short period. And they were sold by or bought by um, DocuSign. But so the this new client, they knew that I'd had some experience with contract analytics software companies. Um, so I joined them, helped them fundraise, and we ended up selling the company. Um, for about 9x, um, 9x their ARR um, at the end of that year. So they they were able to sell and the founders were able to kind of 3x their input, their, their investment um, in about two, two and a half years. So it can happen, but you have to be in the sweet spot. And these were also serial entrepreneurs. They, they had done, you know, these guys were kind of, you know, around, I guess, my age and they, they'd been in the industry for, you know, over a decade or more. And so they had, they had, um, they had some prior experience, which obviously helps. And speaking of a, of a pitch deck, how, what, what do you think the most critical elements are of a, of a compelling pitch deck? And how do you think uh, founders can optimize their presentations to maximize their chance at, at uh, securing funding? I, I don't know if this question is a hundred percent applicable or valid because I, I know that you just, you just mentioned like, Basically, the investor kind of feels it out with the the, the potential founder. It's about mm-hmm. it's more it's a lot of it's a lot about like their energy and, and their work ethic and what they've actually been able to accomplish, um, mm-hmm. rather than like woeing the uh, investor with the potential uh, yeah. growth. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, there's so many different aspects which are critical, and of course, every different investor, each different type of audience, whether it's friends or family, angel, institutional, or even banks. You know, banks are involved in some of the some of the capital raise that I'm in, I'm working with some of my clients. The problem is um, everyone's different, right? Some people really care about the traction you already have. Some people care about getting a deal. You know, they want you to have a valuation that they think is super low. Others are going to look and see who's on your team. You know, is it a team that can execute? Who do you have on, on, as advisors? Um, so these are some things that you might not even think of as a first. You know, the first thing you might think of is, okay, what's the problem? How do we solve it? Um, you know, things like Tam Sam Som, what's the market we're in? But, you know, a lot of savvy investors will kind of be able to skip that pretty quickly. They already kind of figured that out before they even get on the call, just by looking at some of the material that maybe the founder already shared. Um, and they're just looking to drill out, drill down on, you know, how, how realistic is, is this to actually happen? Other things that we find to be critical are, can the founder boil it down to a sort of a, a quick five minute summary and then let the Q&A begin? You know, founders fall in love with what they're doing, which is totally understandable. It's, it is, it's their baby. They're, in, they're, living, they're living their startup day in, day out. And they often, they'll speak for half an hour. Uh, and it's all, it's all great info. If you've heard it a few times and you're familiar, you kind of, you can absorb it. If you're brand new to that person, it just you can't. It kind of goes in one ear or out the other. I've, I've had a number of investors that I've brought to you know together with founders, and afterwards they'll give me some feedback. They'll say, "Wow, that was a lot of information." <laughs> you know, and then you know we'll say the consulting consulting folks like us will say to the founder, "Yeah, try to um, boil it down and you know minimize it. Give give your um you know give your potential investor the chance to just drill you with the Q and A side." Um, 
and, and that's difficult because of course time is limited right nobody nobody has time for a two-hour leisurely conversation um so that's you know half the success is is can you pitch um effectively get the right information across you know you may be onto a great idea you may be on, you may have a really good execution um chance but if you can't convey that if you can't convey that message crisply in a brief amount of time um and create you know fomo or just create the inspiration that the investor's thinking wow i want to be part of this then it doesn't work out so it's a it's an art and a science and i wouldn't say it's something that i've mastered but it's certainly something that um i focus on because it does make a big difference what do you what do you think some of the common misconceptions are um or, or mistakes that founders make when trying to increase their startups valuation? How, how do you think they can avoid those? Um, well, I mean, I mentioned earlier being realistic, right? Um, having a grounded view of what's real, what's what, what timeline, cost, top line, those things. You know, if you have the revenue, double the time it takes and double the cost. You're already you're already on the on the right track, and it might even be more than that, right? And obviously, what I'm saying is a simplification, um, but that is typically those those are typically some of the I think pitfalls that a founder will fall in or, or run into, that they need more money than they thought they need, that it takes longer, um, and that they won't be able to you know promise the investor a three year exit. Um, that I think is important um, in terms of valuation. I think I see this with my clients. They 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 say, well, I, one one of my clients is in the alternative protein space, um, and one of one of my earlier clients. I've been working with him for quite a number of years now, and um, great guy, enthusiastic, energetic, serial entrepreneur, um, knows knows his business very well, has a great network, um, but he says, well, look at Impossible Food, or look at Beyond Meat. They their valuation is X or Y, and they, they just got you know the X company just got fifty million, an investment of fifty million. And this is not just this guy, right? This is all clients. They're referencing other people who are out there getting a fifty million dollar investment at a five hundred million valuation, something crazy like that. They're they're thinking to themselves, wow, I'm out here with my ten million valuation or fifteen, and I'm struggling to get a million, right? And the problem there is, it's like me. Let's say I was going to go and become. Let's say I was going to take my running more seriously. And I said to myself, well, look, you know, I'm running at a seven minute mile right now. I know the four minute mile has been done. So let's see, um, let's see what I got to do for my training to get me to four minutes, right? Well, not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Um, the people that make, that, that, that you hear about and that you read about in the news because they just got 50 million investment at a 500 million valuation, they're in the news because they are one in a thousand or one in a million. Right. You can't compare yourself to them. You know, let's say you had a, a social media startup who said, well, Facebook did this and that and the other. Yes, Facebook did. Um, but that's Facebook. Right. And of course, that that information is public. That information is um, prevalent. And so whether you're reading Crunchbase or looking into a sort of pitch book and you're looking at what's going on, you see all this and you get inspired and you think, oh, I want to do that, too. It typically doesn't happen. So I think just I always find it hard to encourage my and maybe it's because i'm 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 somewhat subjective in the sense that i'm trying to convince my clients not to think that i can get their valuation up to 500 million and get them 50 million dollars you know um and, and have have them only be diluted 10 percent in the process um i'm trying to convince them that that's not realistic and it's hard it's a hard sell we know it's not realistic but it's it's hard to get them to understand that of course i'm exaggerating with some of the numbers i'm most of the clients don't expect to be valued at 500 million, but they are reading about the cases where that does happen. And, and that's a problem because um, it basically puts you in a, it's like me with my four minute mile. I failed before I've begun. Now, can I get to six minutes? Okay, maybe we can do that. Let's talk about that. And let's talk about the pathway there. And when I'm at six minutes, 12 a year from now, or 18 months from now, that's great. Um, if I'm going for four minutes, I feel like a big failure. Right. And it, and, and it, this emanates around the whole, I was gonna, I'm going to say office. There are some folks still in offices, um, but the whole team picks up on that. This, this vibe, this downer vibe. Oh, we didn't get investment. Oh, we're only valued at 12 million. Hey, that's good. You know, you've only been around for a year or two. You just have an idea and a, you know, and a team of five people and maybe some product. And 
to be happy, you know, be pleased. If you, if you watch Shark Tank, you'll know that typically a startup at that level won't get a 12 million valuation. They'll be lucky to get like a 1.2 million valuation, right? Um, so I think that's that's something that's critical. Uh, and I wish there were, there was, you know, the more hype and vibe, let's say hype and news on the topic of what's more realistic um, so that founders can manage their expectations and the whole team around them doesn't feel like they're all failing when they're really not. Yeah, yeah, amen to that. Yeah, I think it's it's so, so important to have realistic expectations. And that's, like, I couldn't stop thinking when you were talking through that, like, I'm wondering if it would help at all in terms of getting investment if you had different, sort of like your conservative version of your, like, projection of growth. Mm-hmm and then you're middle, and then you're aggressive. You know what I mean? I don't know if yeah. people do that already or not, but I'm wondering if that would help. Yeah, we typically have three versions. There's usually kind of a realistic version. There's a best case and there's a worst case, uh-huh. um, whereby the worst case is usually already kind of very optimistic. The realistic case is very optimistic, and the best case is you know completely <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um because that's the spin. But you know, and it, and it is, again, it's, it's an art, right? Because what you do when you come up with your modeling is – you want to you want to be on the one hand realistic, but you also want to um, be inspiring, right? An investor wants to see, oh wow, this can be really big, right? If 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 you look at if I take the ten startups, you know that I'm that I, that I can pick from my list that I work with. If I take the first five years, you know what they achieved in the first five years in terms of revenue, okay, and then compare that to what they had in their plan, year one. Right, how much of the revenue that was planned was achieved? It's probably twenty percent, maybe, maybe it's ten or zero, or it could be thirty or fifty. But it's never a hundred or two hundred, literally never. Now that's not. I don't think that's because any of these startups are poor performers. It's just because that's statistically normal. And so, yeah, three models are quite three different models are quite important. At the same time, had you gone out to investors and said, you know, I think I can do 2 million by year five, instead of telling them you think you can do 10 million by year five, um, just to, to use some illustrative numbers, the investors might say, yeah, that's not really that much. And I don't think I can really double my money here or triple or 10x my money. So they'll walk away. Um, it's kind of a, it's again, it's it's an art to, to come up with something that's that the investor is going to find credible, achievable, doable, but also interesting, exciting. Um, that's that's what I spend a lot of time on um, because there's no right or wrong, right? There is no number that's the correct number. And if, if there was a correct number, everyone would use that number and then they, we'd have the same problem because now everyone would be just putting the same number in their model. <laughs> you know, you have to reach X by three years. Uh, well, let's all put that in on and, and work back, you know. So, and, and a lot of times models are done in that way they're they're like okay what am i trying to achieve here what am i trying to accomplish i'm trying to accomplish x in 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 uh investment at a dilution no more than y okay so what does that mean what does that mean well that means i need x revenue okay well let's back into that you know that happens as well um so definitely there's a lot of simulation going on um and it's all based hopefully in some form of uh, optimistic reality uh, but not always how do, how can founders leverage their existing network and, and relationships to gain introductions to potential investors in order to increase that that um, possibility? Well, it's difficult because you know for every for every startup um, or for let's say for every investor, there might be ten, 10 startups. I think uh, you know I see through LinkedIn a lot of people reach out to me to tell me about what they're up to and what I'd be interested in investing. I do some angel investing as well. Um, and it's difficult because the competition is high. You know, LinkedIn was a platform, I believe, that was quite effective and maybe still is, but was was more effective some years ago. And now I think it's it's being overused a little bit. I, I feel like people like me are kind of ignoring their LinkedIn feed. Not ignoring, but just don't get around to it. Don't get time for it. And so innovative ways to network are, are becoming more and more critical. Uh, innovative ways to reach out to potential investors. Um I haven't cracked the code. If I had, I'd probably be doing something different. Um, I'd probably be doing, you know, uh, purely fundraising support or, or coming up with tools for, for clients to get funded. Because if my if my client can get funded, they're happy, right? They're not only able to pay their bills, including mine, but they've they they put themselves in a position to go ahead and execute. They've got the funds together with which to run the business. So as much as I'm 
into you know finance and financial modeling and maybe ma- managing a cap table, um, helping with maybe their first time audit, with providing f- uh, KPIs, you know, financial data for internal and external reporting, uh, compliance, all the kind of typical finance function. Um, as much as I can do that, I'm never. Nobody's ever going to be that excited by what I'm doing. I'm just kind of, you know, checking the boxes, making avoiding red flags, providing hopefully good information and insight. But I'm not the one who's bringing them the client or the investor um, who's going to make them successful. Um, being able to do that is super critical, and which is why you know once I've cracked that code, um, I was going to say I'll let you know. I won't let you know. I'll keep it secret. But. Um, <laughs> uh, that is critical. Um, you know, what What other mechanisms I've, I find it really important to meet in person? Of course, that's something that for a while was difficult there during the pandemic. I think now that's changing. Of course, again, people are actually getting back out, meeting up. I think that's really critical, whether it's a game of golf, whether it's just a tour of a factory in the case that, you know, there are physical assets to review or to view, um, getting in the boardroom and just doing a presentation in person. I think that's important building rapport um or kind of all the old school stuff because how do you differentiate yourself in writing i mean i've i've seen people write jokes they'll they'll write a note and it's like they're i don't know they'll use the lyrics from a song or they'll they'll quote from a movie and you know it'll make you smile maybe it makes you read on and then if you do connect with them and you know reach out and have a chat first thing you got is you got your icebreaker because you referenced the, the the joke they made or for a while during the pandemic, people were getting on Zoom and they were um, laughing at or, or com- um, commending each other's beards, right? Because men uh, and beards was a thing, right? During the pandemic, I know I didn't really have one before, um, and and so I spread that to kind of build rapport and just because at the end of the day, yes, it's about the numbers. Yes, we do it because we want to make money and retire early, send our kids to college, maybe spend more time on the golf course or whatever the hobby is. Most hobbies. Many hobbies are can be expensive, maybe not so much running, but um others are. And so that's that that's the ultimate goal. But but how you get there or how you differentiate differentiate yourself and manage to um interact with someone who may end up investing, I think has to be innovative, right? It has to be a little different. Um has to be, I think there has to be some sort of personal connection. Um there has to be some sympathy um or empathy. Uh, or, or that connectivity and i think so i think finding a way to do that is is hard but there are ways i mentioned some um because you know just just responding or reaching out on you know whichever platform linkedin could be one but there are others of course um i think the success rate is very limited I, i've worked with clients who were busy maybe they didn't maybe they had a separate job so they weren't f- focused 100 percent on fundraising and they might spend six months with a what I would consider a reasonable LinkedIn outreach campaign, um, where they you know they have the scripts, they have the deck, and just zero traction. Um, and I don't think it was the industry. I don't think it, I don't think it was a problem with anything they were doing. It just didn't pan out. And I think the problem is literally the um, the, the market is crowded. The number of startups looking for investment. If you could add up a startup's target investment. Okay, that number is probably 10 times the willingness to for investors to invest. Could be 100. It's an interesting empirical piece of data that I have not yet found. I probably should look up after the call. Um, I'm, I'm almost certain that there's there's less dollars going available for, you know, than, than needed. Uh, and, and right now, you know, we used to, for a while, we were looking at debt, um, you know, venture debt, which is regular, um, and that's just become really difficult in the last six to nine months or, or even you know three months um certainly the latter half of 2022 and, and so far this year that there's been a credit crunch no question i have a client who's very cash rich who's been turned down by a big bank for a credit uh credit line um for some random reason he did not pay himself a dividend last year or something guy's got millions of dollars of cash doesn't really need the money right now just wanted to get himself um lined up for some growth and can't get from a lot you can't get the yes and i'm thinking well if he can't get it, who's getting it who is getting the so i said to him look you're you're working with a very much risk averse bank here there are other banks different types of banks let's not give up don't be disheartened but at the same time i'm thinking wow um you know banks are really really tough to get money out of right now um if you don't have if they're giving you a million dollar loan and let's say one day that's going to be 
let's call it 10K a month in interest. If you can't demonstrate you have 10K free cash flow every month today, they're not going to give you the million. And that, then you don't need the million if you already have the cash flow, right? So it's quite a conundrum um, working with those, you know, with, with the lenders. Um, and then you can do hard money loans, but they, right now the interest rates are just crazy. And then they're asking for the founders to use their home for security. All right. And, you know, some will do that. Others just, they won't do it. And it's not because they don't believe in their, in what they're doing. It's not because they don't, you know, um, think that they uh, shouldn't need to worry, but there's just this, the small iota of risk that you could lose your house when maybe you have family or you know kids living there, they just won't do that. So um, a lot all flat because they, there's no security. Yeah, that's a that's a super big risk, especially when you're you're sort of factoring in the the failure rate of <laughs> almost every single startup ever. You know, that's pretty high chance that you may lose that. So it's crazy stuff. Well, uh, Leighton, I seriously appreciate your time. Um, I feel like you, you dropped a, a reasonable amount of knowledge on everybody, uh, which is much appreciated. Is there anything you'd like to, to leave the audience with? Like maybe tell, tell them where they can learn more about you or, or learn more about my startup accelerator, et cetera. Yeah, look me up online. Um, go to my website, um, which is www.mystartupaccelerator.com or 360 startuppartners.com um love to have a chat maybe i can help um and i would say to startup founders um hang in there be patient assume everything takes twice as long and you need twice as much money uh, and uh you'll have still done very well even if you get there i think i think um there's a case study we talked about facebook there's a case study where i think mark zuckerberg by by round d had you know diluted himself owned i think only 40 percent of the company but 40 percent of the company was you know still how many billions so um i always encourage my, my 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 clients to not to worry too much about becoming diluted or having the highest valuation worry more about getting the funds because without the funds you can't make your startup uh happen so that would be my advice yeah totally agree well awesome uh again appreciate the time and and take care Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks again for listening to another episode of Growth and Beyond. I hope you take something you learned from the conversation and apply it to your business today. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review wherever you're listening or watching and share it with a friend. And please be sure to tune in to next week's episode where I interview another top business leader and highlight ways to achieve growth for your business. See you then. If you'd like to level up your customer base and let us help you grow, visit testandlearnagency.com.